Amen. Pray that that's uh, on our hearts and minds that we are a blessing to someone uh, today and every day. Uh, let me just do a couple of announcements, uh, actually a prayer request. Continue to pray for Sherry. Uh, that's a friend of Vernita's. She did have uh, surgery on Friday. They removed some tumors, but uh, she, they found out. I, I'm not sure if they found out during the surgery, but she does have colon cancer also, and they're going to have to treat her for that. So keep praying for Sherry. I do not know her last name. Uh, our faith promise for missions uh, this month. So if you'd like to give uh, for this year to um, make a commitment to the Lord to give to missions, uh, the cards are on the back table. You can fill one of those out, and uh, we'll know how much we can give uh, to our missionaries this year. All right, let me, uh, to birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, they uh, have an anniversary this week, not me. Uh, it's uh, Jose and Cecilia. Did you remember that? <laughs> On the 12th. Uh, so their, their anniversary this week. I don't know how many years, but they can tell us. if You want to tell us how many years, or do you remember? 18 years. 18? Wow, 18 years. Praise the Lord. Great. Happy uh, anniversary for, to you. And Kathy Jones has a birthday coming up day after tomorrow. Correct? So we're going to sing happy birthday to Kathy Jones. Kathy, you want to stand up so everybody knows who you No, okay, I'm just teasing. Just right there. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right, we have a, our memory verses this month. The uh, We added verse number three to John 15, 1 and 2. So we have John chapter 15. If you need to open your Bibles to that, uh, turn there and, and we'll read that together. This is all of these we want to memorize. We should have memorized verses 1 and 2. I'm going to look down because I look down at my paper here uh, where I wrote it once in a while. But uh, the last verse, verse number 3, is a short verse. Uh, so let's uh, do it together. John chapter 15, verse number 1 and 3. Let's say it together. John 15, 1 through 3. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. John 15, 1 through 3. Very good. All right, let's go to our Bibles and go to Job chapter 38. By the way, let me uh, just mention, Jerry's not here. My wife is not here today. She went down to my son's church down in uh, Atascadero. One of our granddaughters is, uh, actually, how many granddaughters do I have? Eight. This is our seventh granddaughter that is being uh, baptized today, so she's going to be down there and watch uh, Kara be baptized. All right, Job chapter 38. We're going to begin at verse number 21, and I'll read to the end of the chapter. Now, let me just preface this. God is speaking now, speaking to Job, and so he's continuing on what he's saying to Job. He says, Knowest, knowest thou it because thou wast then born, or because the number of thy days is great? Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth, who hath divided a watercourse for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder, to cause it to rain on the earth where no man is, on the wilderness wherein there is no man? to satisfy the desolate and waste ground, and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Hath the rain a father, or who hath begotten the drops of dew? Out of whose womb came the ice, and the hoary frost of heaven? Who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? 
Or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? <coughs> Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Canst thou lift up thy voice to the clouds, that abundance of waters may cover thee? Canst thou send lightnings, that they may go and say unto thee, Here we are? Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who hath given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds in wisdom? Or who can stay the bottles of heaven? When the dust groweth hard uh, into hardness, and the clods cleave fast together, wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion? Or fill the appetite of the young lions? When they couch in their dens, and abide in the covert to lie in wait? Who provideth for the raven his food? When his young ones cry unto God, they wander for lack of meat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us, your goodness to us. And Lord, as we look at your word, we realize that this is God giving us the, the knowledge of himself. You make yourself known to us, not just in nature, not in just the creation, but in the special revelation of your word that we can hear from you, understand what you are like. Lord, even as you speak to Job here, asking questions uh, that only apply to you, only you can know these things and do these things. And so we understand this and we give you praise and glory. Lord, I ask that you would guide us in your word today. Help us to understand the truths of scripture, to understand how we should act and walk with you, even towards others. Lord, thank you for helping us to have wisdom, the wisdom of God through uh, salvation and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We ask for your guidance now that we would bring honor to you, glorify you, and not ourselves this morning. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Tim. All right, well, let's uh, begin our song service together now. We'll go to song number 472. 472, uh, follow on. together we'll go to song number 502 uh, saying stand up for Jesus song number 502 
Thank you. You can be seated. Let's go to uh, John chapter 7. John chapter 7. We've been looking at the book of John and we have seen Jesus uh, in Galilee, in Judea, and in John chapter 7, John the Apostle, as he writes, he tells us that Jesus left Judea. Judea is the, north, the southern part. If you go back in, in Israel's history, uh, you recognize and see in the Bible that there are two kingdoms, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of uh, Judah. And uh, in the New Testament, you don't see two kingdoms. You just see uh, Israel. Being, it's overtaken by Rome, but you see the northern part, and it's called Galilee. And in the southern part, uh, it's called Judea. And so he left Judea, up to Galilee where he grew up. Look at verse number, start at verse number 1. I'm going to read all the way down to verse number 10. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So Jesus, as you look at this, and you think, well, wait a minute, Jesus said it's not his, he's not going to go up yet. Well, he didn't go up with his brothers. He went up a little bit later. Uh, it's almost like he's deceiving them. Well, he wasn't. We'll talk about that as we go on. But uh, Jesus is in Galilee, it says. He walked in Galilee. He would not walk in Jewry or down in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. So let's uh, look at this. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into it. Father, we thank you for you letting us know the story of Christ and what he has, had done, how he worked in this life and as he lived here on earth, that he lived and lived according to the law. He died and paid the penalty of man's sin. And Lord, we know that only is because that's what you did. You placed our sins on him. Lord, help us to see him and how he worked with people. Help us to understand and learn how we should be walking in uh, living and, and dealing with people. I pray that you would guide us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So John, now when you look at what uh, it says here, he says the Jews sought to kill him. That's why he left Judea and went back up to Galilee. It doesn't mean that there were no Jews in Galilee. But the Jews down in Jerusalem, that's where the headquarters of the Pharisees and Sadducees were. And they didn't like his ministry. And they were jealous. And we even see that towards the end of uh, uh, Christ's life on earth. That uh, um, they knew that the Jews were going to, wanted to kill him because they were envious of him. 
he was gaining a following and the Jews didn't want him want people to follow him they wanted them to follow uh, the the Jewish religion and them and, and for they so that they could have a following now he says he would not walk in Jewry it is not that he could not you wonder well wait a minute he's this is God in the flesh could he have stayed in Jerusalem and stayed in Judea and just protected himself well yes he could have but that wasn't God's plan that just he just did it the way God uh, wanted him to because his time was a set time for him to be killed and the set time was around Passover on a certain day that God had prepared so as he says it is not uh, his time he was not uh, verse number six my time is not yet come some people might say he's he's saying it wasn't time for him to go to that <coughs> feast of the tabernacles um, but I believe he's, he's talking about his time of sacrifice his time of crucifixion was not yet come it wasn't his time to die and so he left Jerusalem and went to uh, the northern area of Galilee I believe what Je one of the things that Jesus wants us to understand and we're going to go to different passages of Scripture uh, to see that we he wants us to understand that we need to go to people who will or who are more receptive to our message his message of the message of the gospel there are people who reject the gospel there are people who just say that's good for you but I you know I'm I don't need it there are people but there are people who will fight you about it and those are the people he says that you can walk away from now I don't mean somebody just say one bad thing to you and then you say okay and then you give up and walk away he didn't give up like that he dealt with the people in Jerusalem uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees you see it all over in the Gospels that he is dealing with them and talking to them they did fight him eventually they ended up putting him to death uh, but that was all in God's plan we don't know when our time is Jesus knew when his time was and it wasn't right right then at this time so we need to recognize that we should go to people go to all people but the more receptive they are to the gospel we are we can reach them and that's our job. That's what we are to do. Go over to um, Proverbs 23. Have you ever been in an argument with somebody? No. Nah, never argued. Never had a problem with anybody. We can argue with people about anything whatever we just disagree why do we argue we've talked about this the reason we argue with somebody is because we each want our own way and we'll keep arguing and the argument goes on and on and on until we have no more evidence on our side or they have no more evidence on their side and we stop arguing what got accomplished nothing we still have our own views, still have our own uh, beliefs. Look at Proverbs 23 and verse number 9. Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. Uh, people who continue to argue, which one is wise and which one is a fool? Or which two are wise? Or which two are fools we argue and you know it really is nothing it does it does not do anybody any good and so if if we are speaking to somebody about the gospel and they put up an argument and they keep arguing and they keep fighting against it what are we accomplishing uh, I know a big thing we're accomplishing accomplishing a waste of time and now Jesus never now I can say this because Jesus was God he never wasted time even when he rested it was time well spent we don't have that knowledge and that understanding of exactly how much time to spend on something and so we we can get into trouble but Jesus knew exactly how to speak and 
how to talk to people and when to talk to people. Go over to Luke chapter 9. Jesus told his disciples, and it stands for us too still, uh, what he says here. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 5. Now he's giving uh, his disciples uh, instructions on going to preach in the cities of Judea. And he says this in verse 5, And whosoever will not receive you, when ye go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. Uh, if they're not ready to hear you, okay, fine. You know, someday they might. I'm talking about today even. Uh, we don't walk around and shake the dust off, off our feet. There might be some people who do it, but you usually walk. I talked about this recently. We don't walk on dirt roads around here. We walk on sidewalks and asphalt, and our feet don't get dirty like theirs did. Uh, but he's, he's saying, shake the dust off your feet. Basically saying, uh, you don't want to have anything to do with them if they're going to reject God, if they're going to reject Jesus Christ. Yes, I'll speak to you and I'll talk to you again, but boy, the, when you put up a fight, uh, you're, you're saying, I don't want uh, Jesus Christ. I don't want anything to do with God. And so if, that, if that's the case, I'm sorry. But let's look over to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, look at verse number 45. Now this is talking about Paul and Barnabas uh, preaching. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Now, who is Paul ministering to right here? Well, he's talking to the Jewish people. Paul cared about his uh, uh, fellow Jewish people, and he reached out to them, and he taught them and t told them the truth about Jesus Christ. Jesus was their Messiah. They did not like it. Now, notice again, it says that, that they uh, were filled with envy. Why? Because people began following Paul. And it wasn't, it was almost like it wasn't about the message. It's just, we don't like you because you're taking people away from us. But look, they were contradicting and blaspheming. Look at verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. See, some people reject the message we have. Some people reject the fact that Jesus died for their sins. By rejecting that, they are saying, we don't care about everlasting life. That's what Paul says here. You judge yourselves unworthy. And so what does Paul do? Keep arguing? Keep hounding? Uh, hounding, keep badgering them, and get, no, you must, you must receive. Have you ever seen somebody do that? A Christian who is reaching out to somebody and it makes, they're, they're speaking and it makes the other person very angry, and they keep talking to them? Why? Have you ever talked to a drunk person, tried to get them to understand the gospel? It's useless. Wait until they're sober, if they ever get sober. But uh, an angry person who is angry at you about the gospel is not going to be receptive. So Paul and Barnabas say, you Jews, it was necessary. We came to you because you're the ones that God reached out to. You, uh, as Jew Jewish people, are the ones that, that God spoke to and gave the law to. He called you his chosen people. And that's why he says it was necessary. But because you say no, okay, we go to somebody else. In this case, he says they're going to the Gentiles. Go over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And look at verse number... Six. 
6. He says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, uh, I'm going to explain a little bit here of what, uh, how this is laid out in the, in the Jewish way of thinking and the, and the uh, ancient poetry in a sense. Uh, what Jesus is saying, he's, it, it doesn't look like this to us in our English language, but what he says, uh, something about, uh, give not the, uh, uh, he says, what's holy to the dogs, and don't cast your pearls before swine. Then he says two more statements concerning both of those, but the first statement after uh, trample them under their feet goes with the swine, and turn again and rend you goes with the dogs. Okay, so you can say it like this, uh, cat, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, and they, and they turn again and rend you. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet. Swine, pigs, don't care about pearls, do they? Pearls are considered valuable, especially the ones that, that you find in the uh, oysters in the ocean. And uh, I, I guess they consider them very beautiful. They just never struck me as anything special but they're valuable and so why would you s s throw them down to the pigs and say here let's make you more beautiful all the pigs are going to do is trample them in the in the mud and the, the filth that they live in the dogs he says don't give that which is holy to the dogs would you take um, basically the idea that he's, he's talking about is something that was offered to God a, a sacrificial meat, a lamb or something, and the people would eat the sacrifice. They didn't just sacrifice it and leave it to go to waste. They, they ate it. And the dogs ate of the scraps. But would you take the good meat that was offered to God and give it to an unclean animal, a dog? He says, no, don't do that. The idea here is, listen, if those people, like Paul and Barnabas did, if those people find themselves so unholy and unclean to say I don't want anything to do with God or Jesus Christ or even hear about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross then turn around walk away from them they're the ones who are making the choice yes give them the gospel but if they want to fight you that's their problem now I, I, I it sounds cold I know I sound cold right now by saying it I feel cold like I'm unloving but this is what God is saying. This is what Jesus did when he walked away from fighting against the Jews. He walked back up in Galilee. Oh, he came back, and he still dealt with them. But they were ready to fight him and ready to kill him, and that's why he walked away. And I don't think we find ourselves being around people who are ready to kill us. But if they're so against the gospel, we can just waste our time. And I've told you about the time when I... I uh, was at a door, knocked on the door, and I was with another, a young, younger boy, a teenager, and uh, uh, the person that answered the door was of another religion. I think it was Jehovah's Witness. And the young man, I just let him talk. And I wanted him to learn because he was arguing with this person. And they kept going at it and at it and at it. The person was not going to listen. Some of these people are so brainwashed, they will not turn. So we walked away and I said, we just wasted time. You got that? And when you hear something like that, just walk away. There are many thousands and millions of other people who are ready to listen. And uh, we are not to spend our time arguing with somebody. Go over to Luke 21. And I know that there are, there are a lot of people who will say, no, we need to, we need to uh, die for Christ. And we should. We should be ready to die for Christ. And if it's, if it's our, our time and that's the way he wants our lives to end up, that will happen. But we don't need to take it on ourselves. We don't need to make the problem. Luke chapter 21, look at verse number 16. He says, And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. 
and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Not just because you, 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 you use the name Jesus, but because you're a Christian. You carry his name. He says, you will be hated because of me. So Jesus' brothers are talking to him in Galilee, and they say, go back to Galilee. Let's go back to John chapter 7. And as you hear what they say, it sounds like they're saying, Look, listen, Jesus, you need to be, if you're going to have a following, you need to be out there in public. You need to be making sure everybody knows who you are. That's not what they're saying. Look, look again at verse number 3. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest, the works of the miracles. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. See, if you want a following, make sure everybody knows who you are. Show them who you are. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Well, it sounds good. It sounds like they want him to be known. But when John puts this next sentence in here, you understand they are mocking Jesus. He says, for neither did his brethren believe in him. <laughs> they're, they're getting him to do something that they're trying to get him to do something, uh, making fun of him. Go show yourself to the world. You need to be well known. Those, his brothers did not believe in him. They had never come to faith in the fact that Jesus was the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Now, we find out later on that they did, many of them did come to be uh, believers and have faith in Jesus Christ. But we see the, the fact that I think some of us might have experienced your closest relatives and friends if you came to know Christ as your Savior when you were older they are more skeptical about you and your change the change that has happened in your life through faith in Jesus Christ if you go up to a stranger and tell them your testimony they're probably more more open but the person people who knew you when you were unsaved and maybe more wicked I'd say that maybe because some people live a life that shows wickedness and when they come to faith in Christ their lives change and when they they tell others about their change they just they kind of look at you like okay let's see let's watch remember what Jesus said he said a prophet is not without honor except in his own country where he grew up he couldn't do many wonderful works. He had to leave the city of Nazareth and go to another city because they looked at him. Now, he didn't, he didn't live a life of sin and then change. He grew up in a, uh, Joseph's house, probably growing up learning how to do carpentry. And the people in that city saw him and knew he was of that family, and he grew up just like every little kid grew up in that town. And when he comes back in town and starts to preach and teach that he is the Messiah, they back up and say, what's the matter with this guy? And they turn away from him. They actually tried to kill him. Throw him off a, a steep place, a cliff in town. And so we have the same problem. They, the, our closest, the closest people to us are more skeptical. We have, a, have to show ourselves. We have to prove ourselves to them. And so his brothers rejected them. He, they did not believe in him. We do know that uh, James, his brother James, came to know Christ. And Well, go over to uh, Acts chapter uh, 12. Acts chapter 12, and look at verse number 17. Now Peter uh, 
had been in prison and the, and the God rescued him out of prison and he came to um, Mary's house, uh, John Mark's mother's house, and knocked on the door and uh, he came in eventually. Verse number 17, it says, But he, beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. So he said, go show these things to James. Go show, tell James that I'm out of prison. Uh, who's James? Well, you think, if you just read this verse, you'd think this is James, one of the apostles. But go back to verse number 2. I'm talking about Herod here in verse number 2. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. So this James that Peter is talking about is not John's brother. It's Jesus' brother, half-brother. He was what we consider the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. And, and so J James, and there's a possibility that uh, the book of Jude was written by Jesus' half-brother Judas. It's, it's um, I don't know, and I don't know if anybody can ever prove these things, but his brothers, I believe, did finally come to know Christ um, as their Savior. Go over to uh, Acts chapter 1 and look at verse number 13. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. And so his brothers, uh, his, his family, the the word brethren might not be his close brothers, but his family, relatives of Jesus Christ. So it's not impossible that our relatives will come to faith in Christ. We still need to stand up for Christ toward them. But at this particular time, John chapter 7, his brothers did not believe in him, and uh, they tried to get him to do something that was not his time. Now look again at John chapter 7. And it says here in verse number 6, Jesus said, My time is not yet come. And so his time, his time of being uh, revealed as the Messiah to the extent that they were even pointing out was not time. It was not time for him to uh, be crucified. It was not time at, uh, for him in God's time. But he says something to, the, to his brothers, okay, that we should have a, at least understanding of uh, either saying it to other people or recognizing the truth of it. Look what he says in verse number 6. Again, he says, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. What is he saying? Your time is always ready. The time for you to believe is always the time. Now is the time. He says, and, and to, to emphasize that, that point, your time is always ready, he says, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So Jesus is standing strong and, and pointing out the sins of people that they need to turn uh, to God through him. And they recognize that the world sees themselves as sinners through the ministry of Jesus Christ. But he says to the, his brothers, he says, they don't look at you that way. They don't hate you like they hate me. You can go to the, go to the, the feast right now, and they're not going to come out to you and start killing you. But if I go right now, that's what they're ready to do. We need to be showing people that they are sinners, even whether it's speaking the word right out of the Bible and reading it to them or letting them know what Jesus says. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And he said, and God says here through the, uh, the Apostle Paul, look at verse number uh, 2. He says, for he saith, this is, he's quoting the Old Testament, Isaiah 49, he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, 
and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So now is the time for everybody. If you're not born again today or now, it's time for you to be born again. It's time for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not time to put it off because putting it off never guarantees anything. <laughs> putting off, if you're in school, or you're taking classes in school, and they say you have a test on Friday, and you put off, put off studying for that test until Friday night, how'd you do on the test? Are you gonna study Friday night? No, it's too late. If you put off trusting Christ, you don't know if tomorrow's too late. You might, you might think, well, I'll, I can live until at least Saturday. You don't know. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Go back in 2 Corinthians and go to chapter 2. For us as Christians, we have a responsibility not only to speak the truth, not only to present the gospel message, verbally through the word of God but we have the responsibility because we are just we are automatically examples look at verse number 15 for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ now you think about that word savor um, nor, this is the way I think I don't maybe you all think it Y'all, it sounds like I'm from Louisiana. You're, you're, you might all think the same way. Savor, it, it almost sounds like taste, right? But it also means, at least in the scripture, it means smell, an, an aroma, or a scent. We are unto God a sweet scent of Christ. Then he says, in them that are saved and in them that perish. So we are an influence both to people who believe and to people who do not believe. To the one, he says in verse 16, we are the savor of death unto death. And that's the savor that Jesus was to the people of the world. They recognized those people who were already dead in their sins, everybody is until they come to Christ, they're dead in their sins, and they looked at Christ and they heard Christ, they saw themselves dead, and they recognize their sin is causing their death and it's going to stay that way unless they do something about it and they rejected him. They hated him because he made sure they knew that they were sinners. And that's why people hated the law. They didn't want to follow the law. The law points out all the bad things. How many people in this world think, I'm not, I don't want to be a Christian because they have so many rules. I, don't, I haven't seen any rules in the scripture. The scripture tells us I'm free, right? I'm free from, the, from sin. I can avoid sin. I am not, God doesn't say, this is what you have to do if you're going to keep your salvation. It's not there. So we understand that we are, as Christ was, a savor of death to the world. They see themselves as sinners. And then he says, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. You know, there are Christians, when we're talking about um, being an influence or being a savor to different people, the person, the people who are unsaved recognize that they're on their way to hell because we are voicing the truth of Scripture. There are Christians who are not living right. They don't like you either when you're living right. They have a hard time listening to you and me speak the truth of Scripture because they know that they're wrong. They know they're living wrong. They know the truth, but they don't want to live the truth. And so they get upset. Now, you're not a savor of death. You're a savor of life. Listen, if you change, just, you'll feel better about your life. You'll feel better about the eternal life that is coming to you. You know, you're not going to die as a Christian. You're not going to die and go to hell if you're a Christian who's living improperly. But you're going to feel bad when you see Christians living right. So many times it, it, it's awful <laughs> that it happens. But uh, like my, my wife worked someplace with somebody else, of course, and uh, uh, 
out of the blue, she, she wasn't talking to this person, but out of the blue, this person would say, you people, I'm talking about my wife and the way she, she has had more conservative views about Christianity and how to live than this person did. And this person would just, all of a sudden, start talking bad about the way she believed. And she hadn't, wasn't saying anything about it, wasn't even talking about it. They just get uncomfortable because they know what's right. And they get after you and me for doing our best, or at least what we are trying to do, live right. They are tasting and smelling a sweet savor of Christ. And they don't like it. It bothers them. Go over to John chapter 15. Why does the world hate Christians? Christians... What, what? <laughs> we do not, and we don't, I don't see it all the time, about people, Christians, uh, badgering the world about their sin. We are just, seems like an influence by our lives. You know who knows how a Christian should live better than Christians? Unsaved people. They, they, they'll say, well, I know you're not supposed to cuss. I know you're not supposed to uh, drink. I know you're not supposed to dance. I know They know all these things. But what? Christians are doing them. Christians say it's okay. And, and it's not. We should be living a life that is pleasing to God. And the world knows what kind of life we should live better than some Christians know. Look at John chapter 15, verse number 18. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Now that's Jesus speaking. He says, if ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, now you, remember that you can, you can apply worldly Christians here to this, not just the world as, as far as unsaved people. Unsaved world, uh, worldly Christians. The world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. If we're not hated or looked down upon, there might be a problem. It doesn't mean that, that if we're not being persecuted and people are throwing stones at us and if that's not happening, you're living wrong. No. It's just saying, listen, they, they look at you and if they see themselves and they see you're not living any different than they are, there's a problem. The world would love his own, even if you're not of the world, but to them you look like the world, then they love you. They don't have a problem. Christians aren't supposed to be loved by the world. Go back to John chapter 7. So we see Jesus then, after his brothers leave, he also went up. Look at verse number 10. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Go over to John or Luke chapter 9. If Jesus had gone with his brothers, the brothers, I believe, would have made sure everybody see, saw him, pointed him out. Because they, they, again, they didn't believe in him. They, they didn't believe he was the Messiah. And they would, I'm sure, would have done all they could to point out, thinking they were pointing out his foolishness. And they would have made known he was there. But he went secretly. Look, Luke chapter 9, look at verse number 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And sent messengers before his face, and they went. 
and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Now this, uh, as it says, he's going to be received up. This is the, he, he knows that he's going to be going to Jerusalem. He's probably not going to leave Jerusalem or Judea area ever again. He's going to be crucified, and then he's going to minister for 40 days after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. Then he's going to be received up into heaven. So he knows that this is the time. So he's going there. And so on the way from Galilee to Judea, he goes through the land of Samaria again. In John chapter 4, he was going north, and he went through Samaria, and he met the woman at the well. He's coming back, and he's going through Samaria. His disciples go into the town and to make ready so he could probably spend the night there. But look what it says. And they did not, the, the Samaritans, they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So they did not receive Jesus Christ. They didn't want him staying there. They knew he was on his way to Jerusalem to worship. Now, what do you remember about John chapter 4 and the woman at the well? She said, oh, let, me, let me read what she quoted to Jesus. She said, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. This isn't the same town. There were people in the town, the first town, uh, who came to know Christ. But I don't believe this is the same village. And uh, these people recognize that this is a Jew. He thinks he's supposed to worship in Jerusalem. I don't want him here. They have a difference of opinion about their worship. They have a difference of opinion about their uh, uh, religion. And they say, no, he can't stay here. Now look what happens. John and... Uh, well, it says John, no, I'm sorry, verse number 54. And when his disciples James and John saw this, remember what Jesus called James and John? Sons of thunder, okay? Look at their attitude. They saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? Jesus, if they're not going to receive you, let's destroy them. Jesus says, no, no. Remember Elijah? Well, when the king of Syria, I believe, <coughs> sent 50 men, and uh, fire came down from heaven and destroyed them, sent more, fire came down from heaven. Finally, the third guy was wise about this. He said, please have mercy on me. <laughs> and, and everything was okay. But here, James and John, they're upset. They believe Jesus is the Messiah, and if these people aren't going to believe, then it's time to kill them. Look what Jesus says. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Listen, he's say, saying, listen, James, John, hold it. Don't you know what I came for? Don't you know that God is a loving God, a merciful God? God is a God of grace. You, you, you're not understanding that. You don't know what kind of spirit is in you. Okay? You're not, or, or the one that's influencing you. And then he goes on in verse 56. He says, For the Son of Man, that's me, Jesus, is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. He says, Don't you know that I didn't come to destroy people? I came that they might have life. I came to die for them, to die for their sins so that they would believe and accept me and accept the forgiveness of God so they could have eternal life. Not just life on this world, in this earth, but eternal life. God is a peaceful God. God is willing that all men would come to faith in Jesus Christ not willing that any should perish. God came, God gave Jesus Christ to save people, not to destroy them. And when you consider that and the, and the, the attitude of, of Jesus Christ, the attitude of God toward people, He has given us a very important message to give to people, to let them know about what God has done for them to put their faith in Jesus Christ and have eternal life. If God was an unloving God and didn't care, 
He wouldn't have sent Jesus. Jesus would not have died to pay the penalty of man's sin. But we have a responsibility. Number one, to our families. That's who Jesus is dealing with there in John 7. Dealing with his family, we have a responsibility. Do we show ourselves loving to our families? Not just our immediate family, but our parents, our grandkids, our aunts and uncles, all of our family. Do we show ourselves as Christians to other Christians who aren't living right? They need to come back to the Lord. They need to do what's right. Do we show ourselves as Christians to people even of other beliefs, like these Samaritans had other beliefs? Do we teach them? You know, that we're not going to win an argument. But the more, if we have friends and people we know who are of a different faith, a different religion, and you know that their religion does not teach truth, their religion get, brings people away from the truth of the Bible, uh, we, all we can do is give them a little truth at a time. Let the Holy Spirit work in them. But do we do it at all? Or do we keep our mouths closed and don't tell them what God has done? Now, we need to be people that are teaching others even as examples we can't just live an example and expect them to come to faith in Christ they need to hear the truth that we have and it's up to us to not only show it but to speak it let's pray father we thank you for the gospel message we thank you for Jesus Christ who died to pay the penalty of our sin and Lord, as, as, as a Christian, we recognize the truth that Jesus paid our penalty. And, and again, we know that uh, his, his death on the cross was uh, the way you paid for our sins. It wasn't just a, a regular death. It was a death that uh, took our sins on him. And he died for our sins because of your working in it, doing that for us. You've told us that. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be verbalizing the truth. Help us to live the truth, but also verbalize it to tell others about Jesus Christ and what he did. And Lord, many people already know the, the words and know what Jesus did. They will even know that they say that he died for their sins. But Lord, help people who have heard the truth recognize their responsibility to accept it to receive eternal life through faith in Christ. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.